to the 50th episode of the Dallas Arts Organization International Podcast. My guest tonight is Sifu Mimi Chan. Mimi is the daughter of Pui Chan, a Kung Fu pioneer who founded the Walam Temple, and she is the chief instructor at the Walam Temple in Orlando, Florida. She's also well known for being the model for the original Mulan in the Disney animated film, and she was named as Woman of the Year in 1999 by Inside Kung Fu Magazine. Mimi is the host of the aptly named Sifu Mimi Chan Show, a podcast where she talks about martial arts, fitness, films, television, comic books, and a wide variety of social justice issues, which is sort of where our talk went tonight. Um, when we talk about martial arts, we often talk about things like self-defense, of course, and discipline and health. But a true martial arts practice also incorporates wuda or martial morality. And Mimi has used her position as a teacher and martial artist to further and champion causes in her own community. Uh, she's been involved with Make Us Visible Florida uh, and as well as um, lobbying for legislation that was passed in the state of Florida to require that um, Asian American Pacific Islander history be taught in the K through 12 curriculum. So she's a good example of someone putting uh, morality and ethics into practice from her martial arts practice into her day to day, day life in her community. Uh, I hope you check out Mimi's podcast and I hope you enjoy this interview tonight. Mimi, thanks for meeting with me today. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, you know, I, I usually ask people how they get started in martial arts and your answer <laughs> will probably be a little bit different than most people because your father is a Kung Fu master. Could you talk a little bit about your, your background? Absolutely. Yes. They, I guess the answer to that was born into Kung Fu world and uh, so grateful for that. But yes, my father is uh, the grandmaster of our Wallum system and uh, started off in Boston. And that's where I was born, but not really raised. I was only there till about age two, in which it was just much, much too cold. And uh wasn't really an opportunity for my father to grow and to have this vision of, you know, building that first Kung Fu temple in America. He really wanted to see that through. And Florida kind of ended up being the warm place to do so for many reasons. And I did start my training while I was in Boston because my father was always stretching me and pushing me to, you know, go to the school and be in the environment. I have this really awesome photo of when I was literally like just allowed out of the hospital, out of the out of the uh, house, and I was in front of the kung fu altar with my little Wallum sweatshirt on. So it's always been a really essential part of my life. But you know, formal classes, of course, started when I was at the temple in Orlando, in which I was in the kids program, and it was really a different type of upbringing. I think a little unconventional because most of my days were spent after school at the kung fu school and my evenings and everything. So it was. Uh, uh, quite the immersive experience. <laughs> I imagine. Were you pretty aware that this was not the way that other children live their lives? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I was aware it was so atypical, but I was aware that my friends got to watch afternoon cartoons that they would talk about that I didn't get to really catch up until, you know, maybe reruns or something that would happen at a later time. And that there were things happening in the neighborhood. I didn't get home till it was after dark because our Kung Fu classes would be, you know, four or five o'clock and then the adult classes would happen after that. And we wouldn't get home until at the very end of the day. So I didn't really have those typical experiences. I By no means did I have a, you know, um, sad childhood where all I did was do Kung Fu. I definitely got to have fun, went to birthday parties. I It was very well-rounded, but there was definitely a note of oh other people do other things after school they don't go to a kung fu temple uh with you know weaponry and people who come to live there and train so um, it, it was like so it, it was just such a part of my daily life it wasn't odd but I did know like it wasn't typical for sure <laughs> was there ever a time that you sort of rebelled against that or questioned it 
in any way? Oh, I would say I definitely questioned it because I, you know, kids will be kids. And I think you can't really take that youthful spirit out of children. And one of the things I enjoy about teaching kids is seeing that youthful spirit. But I definitely wanted to watch those cartoons or take a day off from training or not be at the school. Or if, if there was a cousin in town or a family member and we got to miss class because we had to go to dinner, it was like, excellent. But I don't know that rebelled would be the right word because I don't think there was ever any interruption in my training while I was in Florida. I did spend some time in Los Angeles in which I still did training, but it wasn't as formal. So I, I don't think I was uh, uh, brave enough to rebel, but also I don't know that I disliked it so much that I, I, I was like, I'm walking out. I'm not doing this anymore. It was just when you do it from such a young age, it's part of your routine, right? And it's yeah. kind of who you are. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, something that we talked a little bit about before we started the, the interview is um, the things that are instilled in you as a martial artist, the discipline, uh, the respect for other people, those types of values. Was there ever a time period in your younger years when you say you were in high school where you realized that you had some things that your peers didn't have and that it was because of your martial arts background? You know, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. I think growing up in the martial arts world did make me very aware of uh, the respect factor because I know that in other households, I would be constantly told how polite I was and how respectful I was. And, you know, just kind of hearing that over and over, meaning this is not the normal. But I think as an older teenager, like you said, in high school, you do realize that the discipline that you have because you really are focused on being task oriented and also trying to be, you know, achieve and and be the best you can be. I think that also ties into a little bit of a Asian American household, right? There's there's a lot of expectation there. It's not a stereotype. Uh, there is a lot of a lot of pressure in terms of wanting to uh, please your parents, do your best, not let anyone down. And so I think that you carry that weight with you. But in terms of the philosophy, one of the things we do before every single class is we light incense. We pay respect to our ancestors. And that's pretty much to me as I'm a fully grown adult now, you know, just a practicing gratitude, right? Yeah. And even though we don't say, okay, here's where we're we're doing X, Y, Z, we're thanking our ancestors. We don't say it, you know, it's, it's, it's a gesture. It's a physical gesture. It's not, there's nothing even spoken, but it's like ingrained, right? And you know that you're having a moment of gratitude. And I think having that practice, that daily practice definitely moves you through life in a different way. And I think I was, I was a good student. I did, did well in school. I was disciplined. I did music. I, uh, I, I definitely participated to a certain extent in things, but I did see that, I had responsibilities, maybe is the word, that other peers did not, right? Like after school, again, everyone would like drive to the mall or go somewhere, you know, to watch a movie. And I was like, I have to go to class. I have to teach. I've got kids relying on me. I mean, as a 13-year-old, I had kids relying on me already, right? So you you get this sense of responsibility that you certainly typical kids don't get the opportunity to have like maybe if you're in you know a sports league and you become kind of you know an elite athlete and then you're assistant coach at a young age but in terms of the martial arts like for sure uh, I did notice that there was a lot of responsibility that I definitely carried yeah I imagine so you know both of your parents were immigrants and you know they overcame you know their own sets of obstacles to, to get where they're at they had to work very hard to get where they're at yes was there any ever expectation from your parents that you were going to do something different than martial arts? Did they ever say, oh, Mimi, you know, it would be great if you became a doctor or, you know, a teacher? Or I, th I think this is where we veer into not typical Asian American parents, but martial parents, right? Because my mother, while she did run kind of a business, she ran a travel agency for many years. She's a professional musician and performer, but she was also very involved in the Kung Fu school. I mean, it was my mom and my dad because, you know, her, she was the one that really kind of was the cornerstone of bringing the, you know, being able to speak English very fluently and read and write and, and kind of making sure the business side of things was um, operating correctly. So there was very much a family business. So to flip it back to typical Asian American, it's like if it was a restaurant and they want their kids to take over the restaurant, it probably would have been more like that. I think there was always a very, very heavy hope and 
push in that direction. I mean, I was never told you can't become X, Y, Z, but it was always a little bit understood that I should be at the school. And, you know, you know, and a lot of that, honestly, looking back as an adult now, I probably put that on myself a good part of that, right? But I don't think they would have been sad if I became a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, but maybe if I were a, I don't know that they loved my entertainment, um, you know, foray where I, I kind of left for a little bit to to pursue some of my um, acting and stunts. And although they enjoy that aspect because I tie in my creativity of uh, using my martial arts and my mom being, you know, a musician and an artist herself, I think they could understand it. But I don't, I definitely know my dad did not love that, that kind of slight detour <laughs> from my, my Kung Fu career. I, I can see how that might worry a parent, but I'm sure he was proud of it on some level. <laughs> when did you concretely decide that this is what you wanted to do? Or was there, a, was that ever a decision that you had to make? Was there a, there were a moment as an adult where you said, you know what, this is, this is my thing. Yeah. It's interesting because I think back and I get asked this so much and I do remember pivotally the transition from, Oh, I got to go to class today. And this is, you know, here I go, you know, just go through the motions. I, there was definitely a lot of lost years of where, I could have really worked harder and been a much better martial artist than I am today because, you know, you're there, but if you're not fully present, you're not getting the most advantage of everything. So, I mean, through my younger teen years, I think I was pretty lazy. I was there, but I wasn't like fully there and committed. I think when I was more like 16, I started to recognize, and it's it's actually distinct in my memory, speaking to one of the live-in students that was there, um, you know, living across the street, we had dormitories at the time, and he was from South Africa. And I thought, wow, you came all the way from South Africa to come to this temple in Orlando. And, and just the appreciation for, you know, saving up for a full year to be there to learn from my father and be in, in the presence of, of what we had, like kind of made me realize, like what was in front of me. And so I really took Kung Fu much more seriously from that point, and self motivated. So I'd get up really early before school and go and train on my own and then kind of do my own practice. So I took Kung Fu seriously at that point. Um, you know, around college, I knew like, this is I centered what I thought would be a good degree for college, which was marketing, which actually was not a very good degree because it's not geared towards like owning a small business or running and operating. It's like, if I were to go to work for some corporation, I think it would have been useful. But in any case, I did gear all of my, you know, steps towards that, even though right after college is when I decided, okay, let me take a little bit of time to now looking in entertainment, I did know I would always eventually be there, right? And so I think uh, once I made the the conscious decision to take training seriously and make it a part of my life, it just naturally progressed into more responsibility. Now you're in charge of all of these classes. Now you're in charge of all the scheduling. Now you're in charge of this portion, right? It just kind of kept building, right? So even when I went to LA and pursued that, I was still kind of running and operating from remotely. You know, I was still very involved. Wow. I don't know how you do it all. <laughs> so there's a lot of martial arts schools out there. Um, yeah. Some are good, some are not so good. You know, there's th there's different kinds of martial arts now. We have MMA and different things, and all of, the, all of them are great, in my opinion. But where I think that Chinese martial arts and Japanese martial arts, too, have an advantage or a value that I don't see as much in other martial arts, I'm not trying to knock anybody, is that there's a lot in the good schools, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, martial morality. You know, there's a responsibility that comes with these things that you're able to do. Um, it's not to be taken lightly. And, and they're in your dad's book, uh, you know, this book here is like a, a book of, I guess, lectures that your dad gave over the yes, years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in the book, you know, some of the things that he says are in bold type and most of the things that are in bold type are things that have to do with your character. Yes. Uh, there's, let's see here. Here's a good example. You know, the ultimate goal of studying Kung Fu is to master yourself. That's something that you hear a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another one that I really liked. A competition is not to be used to uplift yourself and degrade the other person. A competition is one way to find out more about yourself. Yeah. And these are things that you don't see those ideas espoused so much in competitive martial arts. Can you talk about that a little bit? W was there ever anything that you you learned 
at your father's school that you felt was maybe separate from something that you would learn at home? I know the same values were there, yeah. but was, was there anything that was emphasized in particular? Was well, it ever spelled out to you? These are the things that you need to exemplify. To, yeah, to... absolutely. I, so I talked earlier about before class, we light incense. So we right. buy sun, we light the incense to honor our ancestors, to have that moment of gratitude, to bow in, to start our class with intention. At the end of every class, we have a very specific to Walam, actually, our my father's style specific to his Chinese village is their martial arts altar. And I know a lot of different Chinese martial arts have specific martial arts altars and it's got their own sayings and their own philosophies or their own ancestors or, you know, obviously General Quan or Guan Yu is usually on the altar. You get that a lot. But in our particular one, we also, the whole class, including the instructors, recite our philosophy mission, our, you know, kind of what would be our, our mission statement or our core values. And it's to, you know, respect, obviously respect our grandmaster, respect our teacher, respect what we're learning, to learn kindness and fellowship and hard work, to control ourselves, learn patience and that self-control, and then to like honor the Wallum system. And so we literally say it in Chinese and English, at the end of every class and we bow out. And so for me, even though you learn respect at home, obviously, but those key words, I think that self-control, um, that kindness and fellowship and hard work ethic, I think it was very much like this is at Wallum because we said it every class and continue to do so this day. And it's, it's just kind of that um, when you recite something and you say it to yourself, you hold yourself accountable a bit, right? Because you say, here's what we're going to do. It's like you make a pledge before you leave. And the goal is when parents ask me about, oh, you know, what are they going to learn? Are they going to learn to defend themselves? I said, they'll learn self-defense, but I'm going to be honest, a 10-year-old child against a 200-pound adult is still probably not going to be able to, you know, like out physicality someone, but they will learn confidence. They will learn self-control. They will learn how to carry themselves in a way they become less of a target, right? So to me, that's more what I consider the self-defense I can provide for children. But what they really leave with Yes, they'll learn this really cool martial art where they'll get to do very cool skills. They'll be agile, they'll be flexible. But when they learn self-control and hard work and patience and kindness and fellowship, like those are the values that I hope my students not just do in the classroom, but we say it right before they leave so that they take it out of the classroom and that they you know, perpetuate that in their daily lives. And that's the goal. It's like all of the hard work and all of the things you do you know, we learn the martial art, but definitely the principle and philosophy is, I think, really essential, especially at our school. That's like one of the main things that we um, hope for our kids. To, and like you said in the book, it's to master yourself, to be a better human. And and that's why I teach is to make myself a better human and hopefully to help others, you know, have 1% better every day. So that's, that's, that's definitely something that's important to us. Yeah, that's good to hear. I'm sure you've had many instances where you've had kids come in there and seen a complete change in their personality after a period of time if they just can stick with it. Absolutely. And even short periods of time, we get to see these miracles. Now, I always tease and, and say, you know, when it and, and you would know as well, it's like as a teacher, it takes a while before you you get like gratitude, like you get uh, some gratitude. But I have so many students that come back after graduating from college or came back from the military or came back from their careers and they were like, hey, I just want you to know this was so important to me when I was 10 years old and I took this class. And I, and I was like, really? I thought you hated it here. This was like, you know, a kid that didn't seem like they wanted to be sitting there doing breathing exercises or whatever. And they just come back and share how essential that journey was for them. And even though we may not realize it at the time, how important it was and how impacting. And so we we do get to hear these stories, but it's usually like 20 years later when, when kids yeah. come back, they're like, we're, we're thankful now. And, you know, thanks for those push-ups. I, I learned that it's so much easier out there knowing like it, what, what hardship is, but it's really, it's interesting to see that, you know, not that we don't get day-to-day -day gratification sure. and, and students, thank you, but you know, you don't really get to to know about all the lives you impact and we'll never know because not everyone gets to come back and tell you but it is so lovely when we get that feedback and we have um you know parents coming in and saying how important this was to their kids and and vice versa just just all around it's really it's really nice to hear so but it is definitely uh can be life-changing for people yeah and i mean that's a that's a great thing for teachers to keep in mind what that is that they're really trying to achieve 
Um, I, I've never asked anybody this question during an interview before, but I think I'm going to start asking it a lot more because it's something that I would like to see. Do you think, let me preface this with something. I, I was friends with a lot of Japanese guys when I was younger and um, they'd grown up in Japan and they had had a choice in high school. They had to take either judo or kendo. It was mandatory in a lot of these schools. What do you think about that idea? What do you think about the idea of um, martial arts in American public schools? Because my feeling is, is that if we had that in our school system, we might see a whole lot less school violence and bullying and other things of that nature. Yeah, I, I think it couldn't hurt for sure, as long as the instructor and the because um, like you said, all the martial arts is great. Right. It's it really comes down to the people and who's delivering the messaging and who and who's teaching the principles and um, what the motivation is. Right. And so I think it would be great for for kids to be learning in schools. I know there are a lot of after school care programs. And, you know, uh, sometimes I think even just a little bit of it, even though it can be very non-traditional I think any bit of structure is better than none I think any exposure as long as it's positive and geared towards the betterment of these these kids can be can be life-changing but I I don't know that that would ever happen (laughs) it's hard enough keeping sports and art and 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 education uh in the schools as it is so that would be a big challenge but I joke because you asked earlier, oh, I do so many things. And you're right. I find myself dabbling in so many things because as a martial artist, I feel like one of the things I feel responsible to do is to uplift others that can't uplift themselves, which is why I'm so big on social justice. And if I had another life, if I had another 28 hours of the day, I would probably have my own institution for education where kids wouldn't sit for eight hours in a chair. They would do, you know, 20 minutes of learning and then move around and get their bodies going. And we wouldn't you know, we wouldn't necessarily have a very conventional way of learning. I think education is very important. I don't agree with standardized testing and the way that we measure uh, intelligence and how kids feel about their intelligence, right? Because we all learn differently. But I also know it's an impossible thing because we're trying to do the best we can. And so, uh, but that would be great if, if martial arts was given, just like I think they should be exposed to sports and different activities because kids will all gain something from, from you know, intentional movement. Yeah, I agree. I, I have a friend who, she teaches grade school kids and she starts her classes off with, with the little kids with Qigong exercises. Nice. And then- they don't know what they are. You know, she doesn't say this is Qigong. Right. She's going to get our wiggles out here. And yeah, she says, always tell the difference when she does those exercises and when she doesn't. So I believe it because we actually forget to breathe properly all the time. I mean, I'm a martial artist and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm holding all this here because I'm not breathing. I'm not utilizing my 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 breath that I practice every day. So it, it absolutely could be helpful. I think that's awesome. Yeah. I kind of wanted to pivot just a little bit and talk about your show because you mentioned um, social justice, which is something yes. you talk about. And when we talk about martial morality, we talk about things like bravery and honesty and, you know, things of that nature. But I think empathy is a part of that that doesn't come up very much, although I think it should it should be. It should be emphasized as part of something that's your responsibility as a martial artist. And you've mentioned on your show before that having parents that were immigrants, you sometimes had a self uh, sense of being an other or an outsider that, that made you uh, have more empathy to your, your, your peers. And that comes through on your show. You talk all about a lot of different social justice issues. Would you like to talk about that? Is that an outgrowth of your, your martial arts experience or is that just you? Oh, wow. I think it's probably a combination of both, right? I'm, I, I, I it's it's interesting because we're having this conversation. It's something I've actually been thinking about a lot lately. And I'm like, am I a product of my martial arts training? And just because I've nature, nature versus nurture, right? Or is it who I would have been anyway? And it's so hard to tell because this is the path that I was born into and also the path I continue to take and, and, and intentionally walk on. But I do think I take a lead from my parents and my father always always, you know, was about anti-bullying and and helping people who couldn't help themselves and absolutely believes like those less fortunate than we are need to be, you know, given care and attention and that we should be empathetic, right? And that understanding that no matter how hard you have it, there's definitely other people have it much harder. And then just to kind of 
have a worldly view. And I'm very fortunate that I've been able to travel the world from a very young age. So going to a lot of third world countries or even seeing like Jamaica where my mom grew up, it's yeah. it's another world, right? And 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 living in Beijing outside in the in the outskirts for a month for training and not having regular plumbing and things that you just really take for granted as an American kid. You just you know, it, it's it's really important to put yourself in in that worldview to kind of see like what's out there. But I think the social justice um, definitely comes from that upbringing, from my parents being good examples of that, but also because the work I'm doing is is just kind of naturally lends to uh, being being proactive and and not reactive, right? Like so, in martial arts training, you're not like going out and looking for fights and you're or anything like that. You just want to be ready in case. You always want to be preventative. You you know you're not you're not trying to um, be combative, right? That's not kind of the goal of the philosophy of what we teach. And so in the same way, I feel like, wow, you know, here's things that's happening and now we're being reactive. Let me take a few steps back. How can we be preventative? Like what steps can we take? And so when I kind of look at social justice, it is reactive because the world is literally on fire all the time. I live in Florida. Enough said there. There's a <laughs> lot going on all the time. I, I, you've listened to my podcast. Thank you for that, by the way. Oh, I, I love your podcast. Um, but you hear me complain about it all the time. And so it just feels like when these things are inflammatory and happening, it's like I'm very action oriented. So I think that part is me. I think I'm very action oriented. Like, okay, so what can I do? I could complain. Or I could try to take action and, you know, sometimes to myself, you know, detriment and, and mental health ma breakdowns, but like, I, I do take it on. I do a little bit take, take on too much sometimes, but I do think that it's because of the martial arts training, who I am, who my family is, but uh, it, it, it lends to just kind of me being really passionate about something and also being very task oriented. And once I get a hold of something, I want to get it done. So, you know, these last, last few years, as, and, and I know, you know, cause you've been listening, but like with this AAPI history bill yeah. and Did you, why don't you been... talk about that for a little bit for our, our listeners and viewers sure. that don't this, because this is an important piece of legislation that you were heavily involved in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so at the rise of the pandemic, we all saw the uh, anti-Asian hate crimes, a lot of violence. We saw a lot of of um, just brutal, brutal things on the internet, right? And so I had my community reached out to me. I had senior citizens who were scared, told me stories of them like getting stuck in the car because people were harassing them and they, they couldn't even get out. They didn't want to go grocery shopping. Parents telling me about you know, things happening in schools, kids telling me they're not necessarily gotten to the point where they're being so bullied, they were beaten up. But I mean, one of my kids shared a story where he had to hide under his desk, but like just the comments, right? This, these comments that add up over time, right? And just, it also lend to a lack of empathy and understanding that Asian Americans are American. And so I kind of dug into like, why is this happening? How can we be preventative? Education seemed to be the answer. And I thought, wow, that's true. I didn't learn about Asian American history growing up. I never saw myself reflected, especially in a positive light, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I did learn like there were Chinese railroad workers, but that never computed to like, wow, we helped found this country as Asians, right? Like you, it didn't connect. And then when I started to learn all of these things as as I've been in this process, I was thinking if I were, you know, eight year old and I heard that, you know, uh, Lu Gim Gong, who saved the citrus industry, you know, like now we have Valencia oranges, everyone loves oranges. And or if I had heard about, you know, the the fact that being a natural born American was because of a Chinese American um, case that, that like that came about, like these really positive things in history came about. And all of our, you know, backgrounds, every ethnicity and immigrant that's been here has some piece of that foundation. And we don't really get to see that. And when I researched in Florida, we get mandatory taught um, Holocaust education, African American history, Hispanic heritage, and women's contributions. And I was like, well, Asian American history should also be included. And so my bright idea was to start a petition, and that petition started. And then somehow, 
fast forward, I end up being the director of Make Is Visible Florida because I got connected with an org that I said, hey, someone help me. Apparently now I have legislation going and I don't know what I'm doing. And I end up in Tallahassee for the last two years fighting for this legislation. And then I miraculously, um, you know, with the support of the community, just got everyone to come together. But I, I got this passed. And so now it is part of the law. But now the hard part is implementing that alongside all of the other things that I listed that are so equally important that we want to ensure all of that is being taught. So it's still a struggle, but it's monumental because now we can fight alongside all these other histories to to be make sure that, you know, it is taught and that we are all learning, you know, all the real you know, parts of American history that we don't really get to learn. Right. And so, yeah, this was this is kind of crazy <laughs> that it happened, but. It's been fantastic. It's been and I think it's a great example of what we're really trying to learn how to do in the 21st century as martial artists. We're not necessarily learning how to fight somebody with a spear in the street. There are other types of fights going on that you have to somehow 100%. the resilience, you know, uh, to to persevere in those types of things. So, yeah, it's a great story, especially in the environment, the current environment. So um, I know that we're just about out of time, uh, but I wanted to ask you something I ask everybody, and um, we might have just kind of touched on it, but what, what do you think the place of martial arts is in the 21st century, these traditional martial arts? I am very hopeful, and maybe it's just because I'm very fortunate to be at the Walam Kung Fu Temple, where we, even through the pandemic, had growth in our school. We had people that still wanted to learn. And that first week I pivoted because that's what I do. And we were up and online having online classes immediately within seven days of the shutdown. And we are fortunate because we are in Florida where we can train outdoors safely. So we were able to continuously provide an environment for our students where they could safely train um, two parking spots away with masks on in 90 degree weather, but we did it. And, yeah. you know, you, 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 you get the information you have at the time and you do with it what you can, but we were able to get, you know, people through a really hard time by still having a sense of community, by exercising, by moving and, and having purpose. And so I, I feel really positive about traditional art only because my students continue to, to prove that, that there is a desire and a need. I always worry. I always worry because there's a new shiny thing, whether it's, you know, the new internet craze or I know MMA is very popular, but I feel like that's that's such a different world. I feel like if that's uh, something that someone wants to do, then they're not for traditional Chinese martial art. Anyway, it's like a very specific thing. It's like you like this genre of book or this genre of book doesn't mean you don't like to read. You just like different things. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I think there is a space for all of it if uh, we continue to keep our community and our our general public informed of the benefits, right? And, and what we've been talking about this whole time is the benefits aren't just the kicking and the punching. It is great to be in shape. It is great to have flexibility. Um, it is... I, it is to me, my martial art, the Wallum system. Yes, you can learn self-defense and you can learn application and there's a sparring and striking aspect to it, but that is definitely not, I will admit my emphasis. Like if someone only wants to fight every day there, I'm like, there's some really great, you know, BJJ schools or some really great MMA schools out there that, that you could do that 24 seven. If that's what you want to do, you're going to have to learn Chinese. When you come to my school, you're going to have to recite the altar every day. You're going to have to sit and breathe for five to 10 minutes at the beginning of every class. If this is not your jam, it's not for you. But I find that we our, our community finds us because we put ourselves out there. And I think, and you, they may really want to learn lion dancing, right? There's like all these different aspects. So I think that there is always going to be a place for it as long as there's really good traditional teachers that are willing to continue. And that's, I think, more of the challenge is the traditional teachers wanting to carry it on. And because it is not easy. Yeah. to be a kung fu teacher in the modern age <laughs> if you want to be a millionaire or you want to like own your own yacht do not teach kung okay. fu it is, it is not the way to go but if you want to feel fulfilled and you know be in shape and 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 be with the community and make a difference then it's it's definitely something there so i think the challenge isn't the public or the students wanting to learn i think it's more i think the teachers are fizzling out just like you know maybe 
people aren't always wanting to follow in the footsteps of XYZ. I mean, I know a lot of, you know, my father's friends who were grandmasters and none of their kids are really doing it. So I, I mean, and just in my small circle. So I think that's the challenge for sure. It's a great but, observation. And I've never heard anybody point that out before, but that is like probably more of the problem than what we usually assume the problem to be. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yes, we're in an internet culture where the TikTok and we only have 30 seconds, but I find once you remove it, it just as addictive as TikTok and, and Instagram and, and all of that is, it is addictive feeling good. Oh, and yeah. when you're doing martial arts, you feel good. You leave the class feeling something and being around people. There is nothing more um, engaging and stimulating. And I think that is also addictive. So I really feel it's more of on the other end, like making sure enough of us, those that want to continue the tradition, uh, keep at it. You know, so I always talk to my peers. I'm like, don't quit. You know, don't, don't, don't retire or make sure in it because it is, it's hard to get someone serious like you could get students but having a student that's serious to like oh I want to open a school is we get calls all the time hey when are you going to open in California or when are you going to open here I go look this is not McDonald's we don't look at the demographic and go oh my god we would make a killing here you go open here it's whoever comes to the school decides to train for 20 plus years and then says they have a passion and then decides they want to move to Hawaii we're like oh okay let's see if we can make this work so it's a long process it's a, it's not an easy thing and so that's why I think there is a little bit of a danger of it being less accessible but I certainly think people still want it and crave it just like kids crave discipline and structure we crave feeling good and learning a beautiful art form yeah, great answer. I agree. <laughs> so we're just about a out of time. Would you like to tell everybody where they can find you at and find out more about Wallum and your show? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm Sifu Mimi Chan, and you can find me on all the social things. I'm not great at social media, but I am there, uh, where you can also learn about my podcast at sifumimichan.com. And the Wallum Kung Fu Temple, you can go to wallum.com and learn all about our schools. And if there is one near you, we do have them worldwide. And so we are are you know op pretty much open for lessons all the time and always taking uh, new students who want to learn this wonderful tradition we do kung fu and tai chi as well as shows uh, we've been we just wrapped chinese new year lunar new year was honestly we just had a show like three days ago so it, it's never ending really everybody keeps celebrating but it's really nice to be able to continue the tradition so yes yeah, so you can find me at sifu mimi chan and all the social things and on my website as well as wallum.com awesome Sifu Mimi Chan, everybody. Mimi, thank you very much.